continue sharing on the subject of giving and how money talks, how important our finances are in our lives. And I want to specifically cover the issue of tithing under New Testament grace. There's tithing under the law that we're not under after the Aaronic Aaron priesthood. And then there's tithing still under the new covenant that many people do not understand. And so I want to want to cover this. I have a lot to cover. I probably need two or three hours to do this, but I'll try to highlight this. And then I made some promises last session that I got to come come through on. So that's going to take a little bit of time. And so, first of all, when you talk about tithing, a lot of people do not even know what that means. You talk about the tithe and bringing the tithe and serving God, honoring God in the tithe. The word tithe just simply means 10%. 10%. It is what you give. It deals with the what in your giving. Now, first fruits is associated with the tithe in the Bible. And first fruits is how you give. It deals with your attitude. The tithe dealt with the amount, and the first fruits dealt with your attitude. In other words, in first fruits, you gave your best to God first. You gave of your increase first, and in first fruits, you're honoring God. You're saying, I believe you are the source of this increase in my life, and so you honor God, and it's called first fruits in the Bible. Again, tithing did not originate under the law. This is amazing to me how many people have gone to church their whole life and they don't realize tithing did not originate under the law and many believe it ceased after the law because it was a principle of the law of Moses. No, tithing began before the law, carried through under the law, but under the law it had regulations attached to it, it had curses associated with it, and we're no longer under those. But I'm going to show you that tithing continued after the law. There's an entire chapter in the New Testament dedicated to tithing under New Testament grace. It's Hebrews chapter 7, and I'm going to try to fly through it. So it did not originate under the law. The second thing I think we need to understand is none of us should be tithing after the order of Aaron under law, but under New Testament grace, we tithe after the order of Melchizedek that is revealed in the Bible. And this guy is pretty awesome, and we'll take a quick look at him as well. He was king of Salem. I think the third thing is that I covered last session was that there were three tithes required of Israel under the law. And if you figure out how much percentage-wise they gave, depending on who you talk to, I've even talked to some Jewish rabbis, uh, they gave anywhere from a minimal of 23%, three ties a, a year, all the way to 33% of their income. So no matter what we're giving, saints, under New Testament grace, grace hasn't loosed, loosed us to give less, I believe grace has loosed us to give more. Now, you may not be in that more category, and that's okay, and there's no guilt or condemnation, but I think I've got some really good things to share with you that'll help you. So the three tithes was, number one, they tithed 10% a year to support the priest and the Levites, and I promised I would give all the references It'll take too long, so I will post these on the website, all the references, so you can check it out. But they tithed to the priest and the Levites to support them. Number two, they gave at the sacred feast. They tithed at the sacred feast. And there were three sacred festivals or feast that they were not allowed to attend empty-handed, and all the male uh, Jews, Hebrews, were required to attend these three sacred festivals. That was Passover, the Feast of, of Weeks, uh, and then which was Pentecost, and then the Feast of Tabernacles. And so those were three mandated sacred feasts that they were to bring offerings. They were to bring a tithe. And then the third, under number two, I already said Passover, uh, that commemorated their deliverance from Egypt and slavery. Uh, the Feast of Weeks was Pentecost. That happened 50 days after 
Passover. And then the Feast of Tabernacles was also called the Feast of Booths. And that's where they commemorated their 40 years in the wilderness and how sparse living in the wilderness was. Uh, God wanted them to remember you're living in tents and you're definitely not prospering in the wilderness. You know, all of those point to Jesus. And the reason I wanted to hurry and I'm not doing it now is my heart just starts exploding with seeing Jesus in all of this. How many of you know Jesus has delivered us from Egypt, the world, and the slavery of sin? And how many of you know Pentecost has come for us, first fruits of the Holy Spirit? That happened in the spring every year in the harvest. And then now the, the tabernacle of booths, if you have a revelation of God, you realize before we came into our promised land, the kingdom of God, we were living in a wilderness. We weren't prospering. We might have had money when we were lost, but we weren't prosperous and we weren't a people of prosperity. And just like the... The Passover, sometimes called the Feast of Unleavened Bread, reminds us at communion of our freedom now in Jesus. And then again, Pentecost. And then now the, the, the Tabernacle of Booths. We need to remember what it was like being lost and in the wilderness of this world. And we've come into, they commemorated not only the sparse living in the wilderness, but that feast was to celebrate the fruitfulness of the promised land that flowed with milk and honey. And I'm here to tell you, I'm in my promised land, the kingdom of God, and it flows with milk and honey. And I remember the tabernacle of booths. I remember living independent of God and in a wilderness, and I'm very grateful. And so I give you all the scriptures of that. I'll post that for you. The third tithe was every three years they brought a tithe so that there would be food in God's house for the widow, the or orphan, and the poor. And so that was every third year. So if you break that down, it's a minimal of 23.3% uh, over three years. And again, many scholars in the giving of Israel under the law, it was as much as 33%. You start, you start factoring in this, their offerings for the temple that they gave willingly, their offerings and almsgiving, um, we just need to be renewed in our mind in regards to how does this work now in New Testament grace and under grace. So let's go to Abraham. He was the one that tithed and established the principle of tithing. And it was hundreds of years before the law and hundreds of years before Jacob's 12 sons, one of which was Levi, that wound up being the priest in the in the house of God over Israel. But let's look at this because Melchizedek is mentioned in this passage and this guy's incredible. I didn't know this. I was never taught Melchizedek attending church my whole life. And yet this guy's pretty awesome in what the Bible says about him. Again, I wish I had more time to elaborate, but I'm going to try to give you an overview of this. Abraham has gone to battle. His nephew Lot had been kidnapped and uh, there was just this mighty slaughter of these different kings and all the spoils gathered of this battle. And now the battle is over. And look at verse 18, Genesis 14. Did I tell you where to go? No. Genesis 14, I'm telling you now. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Genesis chapter 14. Look at verse 18. I'm glad I at least reviewed my brain. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem brought out bread and wine, he was the priest of the Most High. Now again, that, that takes time to set in. This is before the law of Moses. This is before the, the Aaronic priesthood. And the, and the tribe of Levi was set in to be the priest of God over the house of God for and to the people of God. And this man was called a priest of the Most High God. He brought bread and wine, which anyone who knows anything about the Bible knows that deals with covenant, that deals with salvation and, and the remission of our sins, uh, the body and blood of Jesus. I mean, this is pretty incredible uh, before even the law of Moses. Now, watch what it says here. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham... Of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. So the greater, we're going to see when we look at 
at the New Testament, the greater always blesses the lesser. And Melchizedek was the greater. He was the high priest of God, and he blessed Abraham the lesser. Man, that's just amazing. And just for those that are really, really wanting to dive a little deeper on their own, uh, it is just a, amazing, again, how God chose Abraham to be the father of many nations and not Melchizedek. He didn't choose the greater, the high priest. Even before the law, he chose the lesser. And it just shows you the nature of God that he's, he's not looking for the best and the brightest. Look at me. <laughs> God's just looking for willing vessel, vessels. God's looking for willing hearts. God's, God's spirit is, is, is going to and fro throughout the whole earth. He's looking for someone whose heart is, is, is perfect or upright toward him so he can show himself strong on their behalf. So this, this in and of itself is a message and pretty mighty that Melchizedek blessed Abraham. But then look at Abraham's response. Verse 20. And blessed be the God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tithe of all. Abraham gave Melchizedek the high priest over the house of God that wasn't built with man's hands. That's been here before the house of God was built with man's hands. And is here now since the house of God with man's hands was torn down in 70 AD. And so now we have the tithing of Father Abraham. The fa See, this is what I don't get, how people can't see this, how simple it is. It's really not hard. He's the father of our faith, right? And he tithed to Melchizedek. The high priest of God before there was an Aaronic priesthood. Before there was a tabernacle made with man's hands on the earth. So this was here first. This is the greater high priest. This is the greater tabernacle than whatever was under the law. And you just simply need to see that. That it also mentions in Genesis 28 verse 22 I think it is that Jacob tithed to to, to the Lord. Jacob was a tither. And all the tribes of Israel came out of Abraham, Isaac, then Jacob, who God changed his name to Israel. And the tribes of Jacob, the sons of Jacob, were the tribes of Israel. And under the Aaronic priesthood, it was the tribe of Levi that was chosen by God. That takes too long to explain. God wanted all of his people to be kings and priests. But they rejected him. Levi obeyed him and stood by him in a crisis situation that I don't want to get into, that I'm fighting my spirit right now in my mind. Don't go there. Can't go there. Don't have time to go there. But Levi was inside of Jacob. And Jacob was inside of Isaac. And Isaac was inside of Abraham. So listen, I'm going to show you in the New Testament still. When Abraham tithed to the higher high priest, Melchizedek, Isaac tithed in Abraham. Jacob tithed in Abraham. And the twelve sons of Jacob, whose name became Israel, the tribe of Levi tithed in Abraham to the high priest, Melchizedek, before there ever was tithing under the Aaronic priesthood. Did, did that make any sense? To me, that's so simple, you have to have help to miss it. And some of you have had a lot of help. <laughs> now let's go to, to Hebrews chapter 7, because it explains what I just said. And again, I'm believing to just highlight it, go through it quick, but give you what you have to have, to have faith in giving, and in this thing called uh, tithing. But Melchizedek is mentioned in Psalms 110 verse 4. Profound statement about Melchizedek. This guy was pretty awesome. And he's mentioned in Hebrews chapter 5 verse 6. And now the whole chapter of Hebrews chapter 7 is dedicated to Melchizedek. And Abraham's tithing to Melchizedek before there ever was the law of Moses. How anyone that's honest could say tithing is not mentioned under the new covenant is beyond me. Didn't even get it. Got a, and I know him. He's a good brother. 
But I mean, there are people teaching today that tithing isn't for the new covenant. Uh, be careful, Dwayne. But you'd be surprised how many people exalt the old covenant still over the new covenant and have no idea of the principles that came right through the old covenant that still are under the new covenant and we're just not under the curses associated with those principles we're not under all the regulations we're not under the mandates we're not under any guilt and condemnation if we don't do it but to say it's not mentioned there's a whole chapter that mentions it is your unbelief mentioned in a whole chapter in the Bible sorry that was defensive and a little bit of a dig Look at this. Now, I'm going to have to fly through this because the whole chapter is just awesome. Look at verse 1 of Hebrews chapter 7. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness and also king of Salem, meaning meaning king of peace. This Melchizedek that is awesome was interpreted in his name and even title as king of righteousness and king of peace. Does that remind you of anybody in the Bible? Amen. Amen. So who is this guy? He's a mystery in one form, but it's a hidden mystery, I believe, that shouldn't be hidden from the people of God. The mysteries in the Bible are not hidden from us. They're hidden for us. And look at this mystery now. He's called king of righteousness, king of peace. Now look at verse 3. Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of days, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. Did everybody at least see that? So... Whoever and what he was, in Genesis chapter 14, he still is today and remains today and will remain tomorrow. And notice, it didn't say he didn't have a beginning and he didn't have an end. He didn't have a mother and a father. It said in regards to his genealogy. We have no record of his genealogy. And so I don't believe he was Jesus incarnate. He was a real king. He was a real person. But he was a type and a shadow of Jesus, the high priest of the house that's been built by God without man's hands. Hallelujah. He's a priest that continues after the old covenant law ends. No, he's a priest that continues Forever, forever, continually. Now, I love verse 4. Now, consider how this, consider how great this man was, to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. And indeed, those who are of the sons of Levi, who receive the priesthood, have commandment to receive tithes from people according to the law, that is, from their brethren, Though they have come from the loins of Abraham. But he whose genealogy is not derived from them. Received tithes from Abraham. And blessed him who hath the promises. Now beyond all contradiction. The lesser is blessed by the better. That's what I said to you, to you earlier. Abraham was the lesser. Melchizedek was the greater. Melchizedek blessed Abraham. But Abraham gave a tithe. A tenth of all his spoils. To Melchizedek. Here, talking about in the natural and under the law, mortal men receive tithes, but there, but there he receives them of whom it is witn witness that he lives. Even Levi, I'm sorry, get excited, calm down. Even Levi, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Did you see that? So the entire Aaronic priesthood under Levi was on the inside of Abraham. And the Aaronic priesthood that was natural and that was carnal and that was men that died paid tithes to Melchizedek in the loins of Abraham. 
Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, under, under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. For he, for he of whom these things are spoken belongs to, to another tribe from which no man has officiated at an altar. In other words, whoever has replaced the Aaronic priesthood is it of the tribe of Levi? How many of you know Jesus is of the tribe of Judah? Amen. Jesus is not of the tribe of Levi. Jesus is of the tribe of Judah. And that's what he's talking about. For it is evident that our Lord, our Lord arose from where? Judah. Of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. The tribe of Judah in the natural, under the Aaronic priesthood, under the law, the tribe of Judah was never mentioned or associated with a priest or gifts or tithing or offerings. And it is yet for more evident that if in the likeness of Melchizedek, in the likeness of Melchizedek, there arises another priest whom has come, not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, but according to the power of, the endless, of, of an endless life. For he testifies, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Can anybody guess who God declared to be a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, not after the order of Aaron? Can anybody guess who that is? That is Jesus. Uh, Psalms 110 verse 4 talks about this. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 6 talks about this. Jesus is the high priest, Hebrews chapter 8, 9, and 10 speak of, over the tabernacle of God that's on the earth now, which tabernacle we are, and God dwells within, and Jesus, after the order of Melchizedek from the tribe of Judah, not Levi, is who we're paying our tithes to. Amen. <laughs> I'm sorry. It I guess it just took me 30-something years to really get it, and I expect you to get it in three minutes. Hallelujah. <laughs> but that excites me so much that I'm not released under New Testament grace from giving and tithing. I'm released from giving under the Aaronic priesthood to the tribe of Levi to a natural tabernacle made with the hands of men. And I've been released to tithe to the high priest now of the house of God, the high priest that is Jesus Christ, and it's after the order of Melchizedek. I follow the pattern of Abraham. I tithe because I want to. I tithe because I get to. I tithe because I love to. I tithe because I recognize this high priest. I'm about to preach. I'm holding back <laughs> that I get excited about it. I'm not saying you have to get emotional and I get emotional every time I give, but I guarantee you I know what I'm doing when I give and I know who I'm really giving to and there's food in God's house. There'll be food in God's house. There'll be, there'll be in my tithing the ability for God to use food from His house to change lives, to touch a city. It makes a huge difference. It honors God. This is incredible to me. Look at this verse 17. For he testifies, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. He's talking about Jesus. For on the one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness. That's not popular. That, that angered the Jews of that day. That he's simply talking about, we, we've come out from under that law, and that law is fading as far as the regulations, the restrictions, the curses, etc., etc. For the law made nothing perfect. Under that system of sacrifices, it didn't make anybody perfect. The blood of a bull and a goat can't make you perfect. But how many of you know the blood of Jesus can make you perfect and holy and righteous and perfect in the eyes of God? The tithing could not make you or even that temple perfect in the way God ordained for it to be and yet under the New Testament there is a blessing associated with tithing and there's a blessing and a working of God's will in our hearts and lives that's greater than it was under that old covenant law for the law made nothing perfect on the other hand 
there is the bringing in of a better hope through which, through which we draw nigh to God. The better hope is the better covenant, the new covenant established on better promises. And in so much as he was not made priest without an oath, or they have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath by him who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not, oh gosh, this is so good. The Lord, I'm not talking about I'm that good. I'm talking about this is good. Amen. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. See, the Father God will not relent, give in, give up, or give out on the order of Melchizedek. On the power of what happened with Abraham and Melchizedek. And the Lord will not relent. You are a priest forever. According to the order of Melchizedek. Jesus is the priest, the high priest of the church. Not after the order of Aaron or the law. But after the order of Melchizedek. Which was a greater priest than all the priests under the Aaronic priesthood. Well, that's not even popular in church anymore. <laughs> Look at verse 22. I'm trying to hurry, but so much more Jesus. So he's being clear now. But so much more Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. Also, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. How many of you know all the priests? <laughs> I'm sorry. My brain's running really fast. But all the priests under the old covenant law died. So you might have in your lifetime four priests. But how I many of you know under the new covenant, the priest over the house of God never dies. Hallelujah. He died once for sin forever and has been raised from the dead to die no more. But he, Jesus, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the people's for this he did once for all when he offered up himself the priest had to offer up sacrifices for themselves before they could offer up sacrifices for the people because they weren't perfect they weren't holy but Jesus has offered up his blood for sin forever. And there's no more sacrifice that ever has to be made again for your sins or for him. That's right. He had no sin. You talk about a high priest that's superior. This guy was the son of God. He was the Messiah. And he had no sin. He bore our sin. He took our sin. But he became sin who knew no sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God. The high priesthood of Jesus is superior to any priesthood under the old covenant law. And we need renewed in our minds to it. Now let's look at something that, that just blesses me. Um, Malachi. Because while we're not under the regulations of the law. We're certainly not under the curses associated with the law. See when Abraham tithed to Melchizedek there were no curses associated with it if he didn't do it even a tithe was a free will gift and and if you're tithing out of obligation you're missing God's blessing you're missing the purpose of the tithe under New Testament grace because there were no curses associated with the tithe if he didn't give it he gave it out of free will he gave it honoring God. He gave it honoring the high priest. That he recognized. I think I heard the word revelation. That's where I was going. But he recognized this man is a real man. But he is a type and a shadow of the seed that I've been promised that's coming. Amen. This guy was awesome. Abraham was awesome. And so tithing after the order of Melchizedek. 
comes out of a revelation of who God is and blessings associated with honoring Him, not guilt, not condemnation. Not if you don't do it, you're robbing God. Not if you don't do it, you're cursed with a curse. Galatians 3.13 says we are delivered from all curses, and that includes any curse associated with tithing under that inferior covenant and inferior priesthood, the Levites. Man, I'm saying a lot fast. Look at, <laughs> look at Malachi. I got a lot to say. Malachi chapter 3. Lots of things are being said i got to jump in it. I'll keep the context as best I can. But this is incredible to me. Look at verse 7. Yet from the days of your fathers. He's correcting Israel for their sins, their iniquities, their lack of love for him, their lack of loyalty. Let me just say this because I know i got so much on my heart I'll, I'll probably forget it. But for those of you that are sincere about this and are true tithers, you need to understand it is a sign of loyalty in your tithing. Amen. It's, it's loyalty. And I didn't know that. I never heard that. Even at church, all I heard was things associated with tithing under the ironic inferior priesthood. Instead of somebody explaining grace to me like I'm endeavoring to do, and, and, and the blessing associated with this act of faith and loyalty. They had been disloyal to God. Disloyalty is what leads to disobedience. Nobody becomes disobedient until they become disloyal. That's why I encourage you to be so loyal to the Word of God. But if you reject God's Word, I'm talking about the clarity and simplicity of Scripture, then you're actually rejecting the Lord. And when you do that, when you reject Scripture for culture, you reject Scripture for your feelings, you reject Scripture for your family and the cliffs they're jumping off, when you do that, you become disloyal to God, and that always will lead eventually to disobedience. So they were disloyal, and it led to their disobedience, and God is correcting them for it. Listen to this. Yet from the days of your fathers, you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Come home. Come back. This is where I grew up in Pentecostal holiness, and I don't know if other denominations use this terminology or not, but we heard about backsliding all the time. It was like backsliding, backsliding. And we were all backsliders by definition. <laughs> and it was constantly come home, repent. And if you, haven't had a, if you even had a bad thought, come home, repent, you're going to hell. It was terrible. It was terrible. And so he's saying, return to me. Now let that sink in. You've got to get that context. Come home. Now watch this. This is a great question. But you said... In what way shall we return? How do we come home? How do we come back? How do we return unto you? Will a man rob God? Yet you've robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. Let me say this. If I had time, I would spend at least 15 minutes on this. I don't. But I grew up under a system again. If you weren't tithing, you were robbing God. And they condemned us into tithing. That is wrong. That's, that's the lesser, ironic, priesthood way of tithing. They took the tithe under the old covenant law. That's why it says, bring all the tithes into the house of God. They took tithes. Um, under New Testament grace, Jesus receives. Jesus, after the order of Melchizedek, receives tithes like Melchizedek, a type of Christ, in Genesis 14, received tithes from Abraham. And so, you've robbed me, and notice he said, in tithes and, and offerings. Everybody say offerings. If you're going to teach you're robbing God if you don't tithe, you have to teach you're robbing God if you don't give offerings too. I'm not saying let's double down on ignorance. I'm saying let's don't be half ignorant. If you're going to condemn people for not tithing, you've got to condemn them for not offerings. Hey Amen, that was good. I don't care what anybody doesn't say. <laughs> then he says, you're cursed with a curse. You've robbed me, even this whole nation. Notice they didn't just rob God. They robbed the whole what? Because remember, the tabernacle 
was a type and a shadow of the tabernacle that we are now on the earth. And it ministered to the people. It fed the people spiritual things, but it also fed the community. Remember, every third year they had to bring a tithe for the widows, for the orphans, and, and, and for the poor. And so there had to be food in God's house to help minister to the needy. That ought to make simple sense to everybody. God's not going to rain food down out of heaven for the poor people. He did that for Israel for 40 years. It was miraculous. But that was an exception, not the rule. The rule is sowing and reaping. He's not going to rain clothes down from heaven. He tells us in the New Testament, if you see somebody hungry, feed them. How does God feed people? Through us. How does God clothe people? Through us. How does God help the poor? Through us. And if the house of God is destitute of resources, you not only rob God, you, you, you rob the nation. That's so simple. Now look at verse 10. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And try me now this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing such and pour out you such a blessing or such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it man i want to spend some time on this this is just so powerful in my life and the transformation i've seen over the years and again i've given my testimony of meeting sue and i i did not tithe i did not give how did, God says, come back to me. How do we get back? Giving. Amen. Return to me. How do we get back? Giving. Amen. Well, you're no better than the left. <laughs> Have I not taught you your heart follows your money? Yes. Have I not taught you when people are disloyal to God and become disobedient to God, they quit giving? It's in the Bible. It's, it's a reality. It's not theology. It's not theory. It is consistent. I've never seen anybody get mad at God, quit serving God, especially in the house of God, and send their tithe. No, it's when they repent, they come back to God, they start giving again. You cannot separate. I love you. But you cannot separate your giving from your heart. You can't separate your giving from your loyalty, from your trust. How do we get back, God? Okay, we're sorry. We've left. Bring all the tithes in the house of God. And just test me. Prove me. See if I won't open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. There won't be room enough to contain it. Now, I love you. I love you. I love you. Oh, I love you. But people, what is this blessing that he pours out? Again, if I'm a tither, food isn't going to fall out of heaven. Clothes aren't going to fall out of heaven. Gold bars, thank God, wouldn't fall out of heaven and knock you out. What is this blessing? This blessing is favor. This blessing is ingenuity. This blessing is, is creativity. This blessing is strength in your body, strength in your mind. Favor in what you put your hand to. And it starts to be blessed. See, remember, Deuteronomy 8.18 says God gives us the power to gain wealth. He doesn't give us wealth. He gives us the wisdom, the power, the creative juices. The entrepreneur spirit, the ability to, to develop storehouses and, and the discipline. Favor from God is the discipline to take the money I have and not buy lotto tickets and, and, and paper your whole wall. I shared the second service and it just came back to me and I don't want to say it now. I regretted saying it then because I don't have time to explain it. My dad was a good man, a, a, a good father. But he didn't know the Lord. I led him to the Lord. And, and he worked his fingers to the bone. But when he died and I had to pay for his funeral, he, he, he died a pauper. He died super, super poor. And when we went back to the house, 
all, there were three walls, three walls papered in lotto tickets. Again, I'm not condemning my dad. He's in heaven. God loves him. I'm not even condemning you for being dumb. I don't think it's a sin to buy a lotto ticket. It's just not real bright. There's a difference. And I'm not condemning anybody. But what a waste was my point. What a waste. What if he'd have gave that money into the kingdom of God? He'd have had treasures laid up in heaven. And he would have had a blessing of the Lord in his life. That super God would have poured out a blessing that there wouldn't have been room enough to contain it. Meaning... You're blessed. You're favored. You know what's right and wrong. How many of you know that's a blessing? You know, I, I would love to help. Now, I help people one-on-one -on -one because I can see if they're offended and I can back up. And I can go, now, here's what I meant. Do you understand? I didn't mean that the way it sounded or whatever. But, I mean, I could show you. Look at... I, I could show you ways the devourer is consuming your income because you're not honoring God. And he says it. Look at this. And I will rebuke the devourer. Everybody say devourer. For your sakes. So that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground. Nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord God of hosts. Did you see that? Now, I'm not saying the devil isn't the devourer. John 10.10 10 says Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I'm saying the context that God said he would rebuke this devourer is pestilence, locusts, a 30-fold harvest versus a 60-fold harvest versus a 100-fold harvest. How many of you know you need God's supernatural protected protection over your income from inflation? Amen. Joe Biden has always been a serial liar. And I don't say that disrespectfully. He, he just, everybody in politics to a measure lies. But this guy, I've, I've watched him my whole adult life and his career. And I mean, he says things like he came into office and inflation was nine points. And he says it and says it and doubles down on it. And the media carries the, the lie for him. It was 1.4 when he came into office. Our votes do matter. Policy does matter. You're not going to hear much about policy in political races anymore. It's all about power. And they'll do anything. Certain people will do anything for power. And if you... Don't have the blessing of the Lord on your life. Inflation alone is a devourer. Recessions is a devourer. Market fluctuations is the devourer that we need rebuked. And while under the New Testament, we have authority now that they didn't have under the Old Testament, God still partners with us in the rebuking of the devourer. You need to rebuke pestilence if you're a farmer. You need to rebuke anything that would get, get you anything but a hundredfold return. You need to, cow, cow disease, it, it, cow, cow madness is, is a devourer. The woke movement is a devourer. If you study it, it devours everything in its path. It destroys everything. The economy our careers, COVID-19 was a, a devourer. Amen. And I was one of the few publicly willing to rebuke that devourer. Amen, yeah. Amen or oh me. Amen. There is no virus on this planet that can tell me I can't work. There's no virus on this planet that the government has the right and authority to the sovereignty of my body and to put something in my body that we don't even know what it is yet. Amen. It was a devourer. Amen. And because I'm blessed... You heard me say it. I'm blessed. I was willing to rebuke for your sakes even. To protect your jobs. It was a beast. A devourer. Demonic. To destroy your livelihood. To destroy your freedom of movement. Your freedom of speech. Your freedom of thought. Those are devourers. 
I'm rebuking. There is no devourer going to rebuke my freedom of movement. God has called me. God Almighty and my high priest has told me to go into all the world and preach this gospel. And my freedom of movement is a devourer that because I'm a tither, man, I'm preaching. Because I'm a tither, I can rebuke that devourer. Hallelujah. God Almighty told me to speak the truth. My high priest over the house of God told me to speak the truth in love. You cannot take away from me my free speech. It doesn't come from government, so government can't take it. It came from God, and God's going to rebuke the devourer with me. You can't, you can't devour my freedom of thought. I don't even, as your pastor... Violate your freedom of thought. I'll tell you sometimes your thoughts are dumb. I've done that in this message. But I love you. And you have a right to still think a certain way. These are devourers. And when's the last time you heard a message on tithing that every time... Oh, man. Tithe, uh, Sue and I, and if a day is still with me... We're going to tithe next service, and we're going to bring that down. And as we bring it to the altar, we're going to be thinking, and I'm going to be praying. Thank you, God, with your partnership now. Thank you, Jesus, after the order of Melchizedek. I'm laying this at the feet of Jesus, and me and Jesus are rebuking the devourer in my life. My money's going to go ten times further than anybody else's money. I'll get the same amount of money as you get, but yours goes right down the toilet. And I could start naming some devourers. How many of you know smoking cigarettes won't send you to hell? Make you smell like you've been there, but it won't send you to hell. God loves you, and God's not condemning you for smoking cigarettes. And I'm not condemning you. Even the world now will condemn you. The world used to celebrate smoking cigarettes. Hollywood celebrated smoking cigarettes. Now, if somebody is smoking on a, on a movie, they put rated X. They'll condemn you. But how many of you know that's a devourer that's stealing income from you? How many of you honestly can see what I just said? Honestly. Now, that's the majority of you. What if I stood up here and started defining devourers? It, no, we're running out of time, thank God. I'm trying to make a point. God doesn't condemn you if you don't tithe. And God don't condemn you if your income is being devoured. Did everybody hear that? So no one should be upset. No one should be uh, angry at me. Uh, but I mean, it, it's just amazing to me. At, when I look back before I met Sue, the devourer, I could start naming lists. Of things stealing all the little money I had. And then I meet Sue. I meet Jesus. The high priest of the church. Through Sue's witness. And I begin to start giving. How did I come back? I started giving. I started asking Sue. Explain this to me. I'm not sure if I can tithe. I don't know if I got the faith for 10% yet. Amen. Amen. But I want to understand it. And if it's God's will I want to get there. And it just took me no time to get there uh, I've known these things for decades and, and operated in them uh, and so when I started giving and Sue and I partnering it was just amazing how, now listen how much further 10 bucks went oh but you had to, you had to give a dollar so it's only nine well, giving a dollar to God honoring him in faith makes the nine go further than the ten without God. Amen. Man, that's good. I just, this is really good. Amen. Go to Proverbs. It's coming out a lot better than it sounded in my head. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 3. Look at verse 9. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase so when I am willing to give up stuff uh, I've got an extra coat somebody doesn't have a coat I can give that coat that's a possession you're giving away a possession uh, you've you've got 
two cars, you need another car. The one car, you know, isn't, isn't going to meet your need. But even a, a car that doesn't meet your need could meet somebody else's need. Right? No, I don't have time to explain that. Like I have to have a car that doesn't break down because I travel to all the locations around the country. And, and I have to have a, a reliable car that can travel hundreds of miles and not break down. So that I keep my word. Because when I schedule a meeting, how many of you know, you can't say the dog ate the homework when you don't show up. And so a car maybe that's not sufficient for a need I have may be for somebody just driving back and forth to work 15 miles. An unbelievable blessing. That's a possession. And when I give that, I'm honoring God. I've given away lots of cars. We've given away houses. I honor God in that, is what the scriptures say. Then he says, and with the first fruits, everybody say first fruits, of any increase. So every week my check is an increase. If somebody gives me something, that's an increase. And notice he called it first fruits, not the bottom of the barrel. I'm not condemning you, but a lot of people really don't give, even at church, they tip God. If they're not getting anything out of it, they're not going to give. Because they think they're giving to man. They think they're under the Aaronic priesthood. That they're giving me their tithes or something. Really slow. I wish I was taking your tithes. <laughs> I would be prosperous. So, so first fruits doesn't mean we've paid all our bills. We've gotten back from our crews. And, and we got 30 bucks left over. Let, let's give 10 at church when the plate comes by. Are you with me? Yeah. That's not first fruits. First fruits is first. It's off the top. Now let me just answer something. I'm running out of time. Bless my heart. I'm not going to answer the question, do I tithe off the gross or the net? The, no, you're not to answer the question. <laughs> if it was anybody but you, I would let it go. I'm not going to, nor am I going to let the front row answer. The question, do I tithe off the gross or the net? You've missed the whole point. You missed the whole point. So, now he says first fruits. Meaning... That's how you honor God. You're putting God first, not last. This is what Cain did. Because I'm running out of time, I'm not going to be able to turn to Genesis chapter 4 and where Cain gave an offering and, and Abel gave an offering. There's a lot of speculation over that. I need to be careful. Uh, but I really believe I understand to a measure. I don't have full understanding of why God rejected Cain's offering, but it's evident, according to Hebrews 11.4, that Abel gave the more excellent sacrifice by which it testified of his very righteousness. Abel gave the firstborn. I'm not trying to advocate tithing, but it was the firstborn of his lambs and the fat thereof. That's, the, that's the, the, the extras associated with it. And that's what made it a more... His heart was what made it a more excellent sacrifice. I heard people years ago teach that, well, it was because he gave a lamb and, and Cain gave fruit of the ground. Uh, so that was displeasing to the Lord or he rejected it. Brothers and sisters, I love you again. But 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 12 says, God doesn't ask us to give what we don't have. He just asks us to give out of what we do have. God wasn't requiring a lamb under the old covenant law that hadn't been given yet. Fruit of the ground was not only acceptable, it was commanded by God. The fruit of the vine, the fruit of your trees, the fruit of your oil, the fruit of your wine. Those were blessings and commandments in giving to God. It wasn't what he gave, it was how he gave. And we know his heart wasn't right because of his jealousy toward his brother Abel and killing him. Amen. Your heart matters and first fruits deals with your heart. Tithing deals with your loyalty 
and commitment. First fruits deals with your heart. That I put God first place. That I honor you with this. Because I believe all I have came from you. You're asking for a tenth just for the ministry on the, on the earth. And, and to Jesus, the high priest, the saints. What would the church look like if nobody gave? How could we be a blessing in the community if nobody gave? How could we, how could we support missionaries if nobody gave? Amen. This is not hard. Honor the Lord with all your possessions and with the first fruits of your increase. So shall your barns be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. So you see there how that in our giving, we're not digressing, we're increasing. And listen to me, that takes faith. It used to bother me how it upset people when you talk about money. To this day, I haven't arrived. I have a national television broadcast now that airs daily. We're on multiple stations again. And I still struggle with asking for partners and giving because I know people's attitudes and I know I'm trying to help them but they think I'm trying to take something from them just like at church people people really believe you're trying to take something from them instead of positioning them to receive something from God Amen. <laughs> and it doesn't make sense to the carnal mind to somebody who does not have faith Giving up $1 when you have $10 is not getting ahead. I understand that. I was there. I looked at Sue's giving and tithing was the floor for her. It was the floor. Go to 2 Corinthians 8. I'm not going to make it. I saw her tithing. I saw her giving to different Different organizations. Uh, I don't want to give any details or anything. Can't remember them anyway. That was that was 43, 4, 44 years ago, and I've slept since then. And but I just know looking at it, going, "This won't work." I can remember saying it. This won't work. I can't. I don't know if I want to marry this girl or not. I've only got a little, and she's gonna give it all away. She was awesome. Now again, I'm not exalting her and putting myself down. I've left her in my dust on the revelation. So let's keep everything in context. <laughs> but she taught me. She modeled it. And look at 2 Corinthians 8, um, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Now, brothers and sisters, I need more time. We'll have to come back to this in another opportunity that I may have in the future or something. But the dishonesty in the church sometimes bothers me. We, we ought to be honest about things. We ought to be from the podium especially. I don't know what that means. That's okay. Um, I was wrong about that. And that should give people hope that if you've been wrong about something, you can change too. And on and on it could go with the honesty. But there are people that have such a bad taste about prosperity and the abuses they've seen. They take this scripture and they say, yeah, Jesus was made poor so we could be made rich. That, that's talking about in, in, in uh, 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 favor, rich in... Uh, um, um, Spiritual stuff. I'm running out of time. And I'm just disappointed. And so I'm sorry. Saints, an honest person that reads 2 Corinthians chapter 8, the whole chapter is talking about money. Amen. The next chapter, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, the whole chapter is talking about money. You can't take it out of its context. Jesus was made poor on the cross so we could be made rich through his poverty. Jesus died for our sins, our sicknesses, and poverty. And I've already given you a couple of hours on poverty is not a blessing. 
We're here to help you. We're not here to enable poverty. We're not here to support people in poverty. But we are here to help people struggling. We're here to definitely minister to the poor. But we're to help you to get out of poverty. Amen. Amen. And then the next chapter, chapter 9, he talks about how every man needs to purpose in his own heart what to give. And that if you sow sparingly, you will reap sparingly. If you sow bountifully, you will reap what? So even now, I'm going to quit because I'm in the red. But even, even in giving and giving sparingly, you need to believe for a harvest on that so you can transition from giving sparingly to giving bountifully. I gave and Sue and I gave bountifully in percentages when we first got started. We've increased those percentages, but we've also increased what and how much we're able to give now uh, because we're sowing bountifully, we're reaping bountifully. Even in your storehouses that I taught you, you're sowing and you're to reap bountifully in your storehouses. God will bless your 401k. God will bless land you've bought. God will bless investments you've made. Investments you've made, you're supposed to pray over those and say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke the devourer. My stocks are going up in Jesus' name. Well, they just went down. Watch them spring back. <laughs> you just are relentless with rebuking the devourer. There's so much. But that had to help somebody. Praise the Lord. If you can't tithe, these messages weren't intended to pressure you into tithing or to condemn you for not tithing. The idea is start giving something. Give offerings. But give them believing you're sowing Give them believing you're honoring God at some degree. And so, just go over these things. I'll post all those scriptures on those feasts, because those are new to people. Father, I just thank you for jobs, raises, promotions, witty inventions, creativity, investments, giving, and giving more as we reap more. Thank you for these principles. Thank you, Jesus. You are the high priest that we pray to and that we give gifts to. Thank you for blessing us and making us a blessing. In your name I pray. Amen.